Our reading from the scriptures is from the prophecy of Micah, chapter 7. Micah, chapter 7. Micah wrote primarily for Judah, a little bit for Israel, but Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians when Micah was yet a prophet among those nations. But he sees the true church disappearing. First the ten tribes were taken away, and then the Assyrians invaded the land of Judah in such a way that they took everything of the whole of the kingdom except for just the city of Jerusalem. And as you are familiar with that, they would have taken Jerusalem too, but in one night, God sent his angel and killed 186,000 186, of the Assyrian army. And they returned home with their tail between their legs. In this, ver in this chapter, rather, the prophet is initially talking about the supremacy of God. But he first, in the first six verses, talks about the supremacy of God in judgment. A judgment that is expressed first in the morals of the people. Then in verse 3, you'll see it in the leadership of the people. And then in verses 5 and 6, a judgment that's expressed in the family. So, woe is me. For I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the grape gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. As prince asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire. So they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend. Put not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Jesus quoted that verse in Matthew chapter 10. Now, there's the supremacy of God in judgment being expressed upon Judah. Now, he turns that around, and he looks heavenward, and he looks to God. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness... The Lord shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Then she that is mine enemy shall see it and shame shall cover her which said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. In the day that thy walls are to be built, in that day shall the decree be far removed. In that day also he shall come even to thee from Assyria and from the fortified cities and from the fortress, even to the river and from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. Notwithstanding. The land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doings. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage which dwells solitarily in the wood, 
in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him marvelous things. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Now these next two verses are our text for this morning. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depth of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy of, to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. So we take as our theme that expression that begins verse 18. Who is like a God unto thee? And if God showed his supremacy in judgment in the first six verses, here we see the supremacy of God delighting in mercy. The supremacy of God delighting in mercy. His supremacy. First of all, we want to consider that mercy of God, the meaning of that. Then we're going to see the manifestation of that in that he pardons and forgives. And then we're going to end with marveling. That's where we have to end. Marveling, who is a God like unto thee? So first, God is a God who shows mercy to forgive. Mercy. Mercy is an attribute of God, a divine attribute. That divine attribute seeks to bless. Scripture speaks of bowels of mercy. And then the meaning and the idea is, is that the, the desire to bless arises from the depths of God's being. So it's an attribute of God, according to which he desires, firmly, strongly desires to bless, first, himself. He desires to bless himself as the highest good. Delights to bless, in himself, bless himself. Now, when that attribute of God is evidenced outside of himself, not just within, but outside of himself, then it's that deep-seated desire of God and divine attribute again, according to which he desires to bless some who are miserable. Not just in a condition, their circumstances are miserable, they are miserable. Now, because it's a divine attribute, two things. It's eternal. It doesn't begin sometime and then end another time. It's eternal as God is eternal, a divine attribute. It doesn't have a start and then maybe some gaps, some times when he isn't. God is always God. And he is always full of mercy. And that attribute is unconditional. Is there a, a condition that he must fulfill in order to be merciful to himself, desire to bless himself? Absolutely not. And when that attribute is shown outside of himself, 
the same thing is true. There's no conditions so that he will show that mercy. God's mercy then is not a passing emotion that is there at times. He will save us if we would turn to him or if we would accept his offer to bless us. It's God's will. Irresistible will. God's will to deliver us in his mercy. Romans 9 quotes something from Exodus 33. Rather familiar words. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and compassion on whom I will have compassion. Exodus 33, 19, Romans 9. He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. So God, because it's a divine attribute, governs and controls all things, determined everything that would happen, life, death, health, sickness, everything, as, a, as the background in which to display <coughs> mercy. Now, all the other attributes of God too, but we're going to focus on that of mercy. Now, what, what makes this display of God's mercy so amazing, so surpassing understanding, is this. That statement at the end of verse 18. He delights in mercy. The literally, he takes pleasure. He desires. He is pleased to dispense mercy. It's not something that he is forced to do. It's not something that he has to work hard to do. He delights in it. He delights to bless the miserable. <clears throat> Let that sure is good that he does. Because all that we do <coughs> is continue to wallow in our miserable sins and conditions. But he delights. Now, let's just do a little parentheses here a minute. Most of you might not be familiar with the prophecy of Micah. Or if you are, there's two verses that you might know. 5 verse 2 in Bethlehem, Judah. So Herod knew about Micah, or he learned about Micah, 5 verse 2, when the wise men came, you've got to go to, to Bethlehem. But especially what we might know is 6 verse 8. That's why Bill's coffee shop is called 6 8, or one of the reasons is a reference and reflection of this passage, 6 verse 8. Wherewithal shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God, Shall I come with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old, the best ones? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I come with the firstborn of my for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? To do justly, to walk humbly with thy God, and the middle one, to love mercy. God wants his children to reflect the Father. He delights in mercy, being merciful, and he calls us, his children, this is what he requires, do justly, walk humbly with love mercy. Understandable why that would be so important to God to require of his children 
that we love to be merciful. No, in our text, God expresses his mercy in forgiving. What does he have to forgive? Again, the Hebrew, every word in the Hebrew, or most words in the Hebrew language, draw a picture. And that which we find, in that which God is to forgive a verse, is this. Iniquity and transgression. Iniquity is looking at something first that's very nice and beautiful and useful. But the word iniquity means that you take that nice thing and you twist it and you pervert it. You destroy its use. And by, by destroying and perverting an activity that otherwise could be good, but sin perverts it and make iniquity, then in addition, the thought is, it shows the fruitlessness of doing something. It, the idea is this. A sinner never gets anything for himself that he would like to get out of sin. He may have a very quick temporary taste and, it's, and it tastes good, but it becomes gall, it becomes bitterness into his soul. Iniquity, sin, the nature of our sin and sinfulness is that it twists everything that's good, every relationship. Iniquity destroys it and makes it fruitless. The second word is transgression. That's bold-faced rebellion. We will not accept the results of an election. I refuse. I want to do my own will. Now, we may look at some protesters today, as I've implied, but now let's look at self. Transgression is, I don't want to. And I'm not going to. And you can't make me. Parents, I'll call the cops. Or, this is what I want to do, and nobody's going to stop me. Transgression. You can see that it's an attitude of wanting to do one's own will, resulting in bold rebellion against the God who sets the law. So now we got pictures describing sin and sinfulness. And now look, now look at what mercy does. Mercy is manifested, and it's not just one statement, but if you look at 18 and 19, five different expressions are used to describe forgiveness. Five. First one is pardon. Pardon. Lift it off. We would often, when we make our petition in the Lord's Prayer, let loose. When the consistory prays before God concerning a sinner, they alone have that right to bind, and then it's bound in, or to loose the sinner from his sin, and then it's loosed in heaven. Loosed. Let go. Pardon means, conveys that idea so that the sin is no longer attached to us. It's away from us. The next word is passed by. Literally, passed over, take away, do away. Now, it doesn't mean pass over in the sense of ignore, but the picture, pass over, 
Passover feast, Passover, the angel of death passed over those homes in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel had put the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their homes. They passed over, passed by the transgression. God is justly angry. Verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord. God sometimes in the realm of creation brings a tornado, a lightning flash, a flash flood, an earthquake, And we hear, especially in the clap of a thunder, God, because he's so holy, must always respond to these perversions, these iniquities, these transgressions, these open rebellions. He must respond. And he does to every sin. Every sin and all sinfulness. He is that way toward it. Now, the sinner can experience anger from another human. And the, the word retaineth is, okay, I did something wrong. I deserve their anger. How long? How long is the silent treatment going to go on? How long are they going to scowl? And will there ever be a smile? So the word retaineth literally means gets hard, tough. But now he says here, he not only pardons and passes by, but he retains not his anger. Instead of becoming hard and firm against, he becomes tender-hearted. And tender-heartedness is obviously an attitude where he's very open to us. Then in verse 19, he adds two more. He will subdue our iniquities. Subdue means literally keep under, force, keep in bondage. He will subdue it. He will set it before our face all the time. You deserve my anger. But he says, no, he will not. Those go away. And then the last one, he casts. A lot of you will remember when, as a seminarian, Reverend Brian Heisinger stood over here and he said, now take a diamond and we drop it into the deepest part of the ocean. That's what God does with our sins. Except it's more forceful than just dropping. The word cast means to throw, to hurl. Cast it away. He casts all our sins into the depths of the sea. Now, pardon, pass by, no longer angry, will subdue, cast. All of that, of course is the work of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. God is angry, and if you think God was not angry at your sins, then you really don't get the cross. Look at the cross. Jesus suffered God's wrath, indignation, But he paid it. And the manner in which he willingly 
took upon himself all of that wrath, absorbed it for himself, is an activity that God accomplished through Jesus' obedience, willing, deliberate obedience, the forgiveness of all of our sins. And the ability of God to say, I not only forgive, I not only, not only look at you just as if you'd never sinned, I look at you as if you'd done everything right. Everything that Jesus has accomplished for us. That's cross of Christ. In greatest compassion, he disposes of our sins into the depths of the sea. Now again, just a figure of speech. Because with all the technology that we would have, it might be possible to find the tiniest carat of diamond in the deepest part of the ocean. Because it'd still be there. But the nature of the forgiveness that God gives to us in Jesus Christ is that it's gone. It's gone. But this is just a way for us humans who think, who concretely fear the judgment day because then all of our sins are going to be read. And we become very scared about that day. And the answer of God is, I threw it. I threw every one of yours into the depths of the sea. I set them behind my back. I walk away from them. I will remember them no more. The perfect God who remembers everything says, I will remember your transgressions no more. They're so gone. So that as we sit before the judgment seat of God, that powerful mercy of God to bless becomes evidenced in his willingness to say, I paid it all. And then he sets the one who died for us in the judgment seat. Our Savior sits as our judge. And the sins are red. Oh, they're going to be red. But we're going to be there in our new man. We're going to be sheep. Resurrected body. Resurrected mind. And we're going to understand that that judge says, oh, I covered that one too. Gone. Forgiven. Pardoned. I passed by it. I went over it. I saw. I paid. It's gone. Beloved in Jesus Christ, you answer your conscience, which accuses you with this verse, the powerful mercy of God says, God, now, your conscience and your understanding of this Here's the circle. We'll enable you to say to anybody who's ever hurt you, and every memory of every hurt, it's gone. I forgive. But then there's this side too. In the way of forgiving, you're going to taste this mercy and your own forgiveness. And that's the way Jesus does it. This is how he wants you to pray. This is how you hear the words of the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our debts. As I forgive my debtors. You retain it. You keep the grudge. You don't forgive. Don't come. Don't take. You eat judgment. Love 
to be merciful. Love to forgive. Because, only one reason, God for Christ's sake hath forgiven all my sins. They're gone. I wouldn't believe it, but he says so. So they have to be. The Bible tells me so. Now that forgiveness that God, that is a manifestation of God's mercy, amazing, unsurpassable mercy, incomprehensible mercy. Well, it's given to those that are his heritage. He says that too. The remnant of his heritage. Two things before we get to that concept of heritage. Look at verses 8 and 9 because they're vital. In verses 8 and 9, we have a good, beautiful description, an accurate description of not only humility, but also confession. And it's expressed this way. I fall. It's an admission. I have sinned against Jehovah. I fell and I keep falling. Two, I sit in darkness. No light. No light of life. It's the thick blackness of the ninth plague and the thick blackness of the cross those three hours I'm in darkness with myself and God I bear the indignation of Jehovah because I have sinned against him this is, this is what, it, what we're trying to convey. If I have a tiniest little cup and all my sins fit into that, then that's all the forgiveness that I'm going to experience. If I can put all my sins in a larger glass, then that's all the forgiveness I'm going to experience. If this world cannot hold all my sin, and it can't, all the sinfulness that's, that is the pool, the cesspool out of which every sin and thought comes, then the wonder of forgiveness is going to match. I sit in darkness. I fall. I bear rightly the indignation of Jehovah. That's what I deserve. Then you're going to taste it and know it. And so that we all really get accurately just what we've done that's why the judgment day will have us all sit there for however long it takes to read every single sin and all the sinfulness of all of God's people so that we will see what he really did there is no one as merciful as God or as loving as Jesus to take it all away. So who received this? Those who know their sin and their sinfulness. 
but also those then who can identify themselves as God's heritage. That's an interesting expression. You, you find it, well, here it is in, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. Jehovah's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. That's the way the scriptures use heritage and inheritance. And then you have the same thing in Isaiah 43. I even, I, no, verse 21. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. I have bought them. They're my inheritance and my heritage. I've formed them for myself. I've made them. Those elect in Christ. But then he adds, there's a remnant. The scraps. It's not what you put on the table at the beginning of the meal. It's when the pan is empty and then there's a little bit left that you can scrape into, from the corners. That's the remnant. What, what, what that emphasizes, beloved, is that what, which makes God's grace and his mercy so <laughs> unbelievable that I would get it, that, that we would be given that mercy, is this. God wants us to know that nobody deserves it. Nobody in all the world. And when we think our children have to, he says, no, no, they don't. They don't deserve it. They've done nothing to earn it. And you haven't, you haven't, in your training of them, done anything to make them deserve it. Or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. No. It's to show you that it's mercy. It's undeserved. A remnant. But it's given. It's given. Now, the marvel of it is in those first words. Who is a God like unto thee? Who is a God like unto thee that forgives that delights in mercy. Here's the very interesting and neat part. This is cool. The name Micah means who is like Jehovah. So he takes his own name and he puts that, as it were, at the very beginning of verse 18. He wants us not just to, to get this, Oh yeah, I understand it. Okay, see ya. Let's go on. He wants us to marvel. To be absolutely amazed. To be so thrilled that we say, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. And with my mouth I will make known His faithfulness to all generations. I can't shut up. I can't keep this bound up. I can't keep it in. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will. Who is a God like our God who would forgive so much that he would even forgive? Now, that's the correct way to respond. Here's the danger for us being brought up to have the mercy of God and His grace talked about so often. Yep. Good preacher. Good sermon, preacher. We needed that. I like that. And then we go our way. What's going to happen this afternoon? Will you still be marveling? What about tonight? How about Monday? How about when things don't go well at work? 
How about when the kids don't appreciate the meal again? How about when somebody hurts you? I mean really hurts you. How about when you watch your mother or a child die? Marvel that you are forgiven by someone who delights to be merciful. Don't ever take that horribly sinful attitude about teenagers and young people. Well, they're young. What do you expect? I was that way and I grew out of it. <sighs> so you think God doesn't have anger for the sins of young people like he does old people? We have a God who's amazing. Work, meditate, Think about how wonderful God is and that he is your God and your Father. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, take this word. Don't just put it in our heads. Thrill our hearts so we sing of thy mercies and make known thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. For Jesus' sake, amen.